Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, Sacred Geography, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Friday, December 8th, around 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2023. An impulsive M5.4 solar flare shooting off the sun. The good news is that no large coronal mass ejection has been detected. But there was an R2 moderate radio blackout as we wait for the white Christmas forecast. Keep calm. It's boom time. We got a lot to talk about. Massive weekend storm to pummel eastern U.S. with heavy rain, damaging winds, snow, and severe weather. And take a look. Large hail possible overnight in Arc La Tech. So heed the warnings. Full forecast is coming up in just a moment. Severe weather risk is expanded for Alabama on Saturday. That's good news to know. And a southeastern hailstorm is possible this weekend, so buckle up and put your helmets on. As winter weather warnings for four states in the northwest amid heavy snow and whiteout conditions continue. And here's the forecast. A strong cold front continues crossing the central and eastern states into the weekend. A strong cold front continues to cross from the central U.S., reaching the east coast by Sunday. Gusty winds and snow are expected for the Rockies, northern plains, upper Midwest through Saturday. Severe thunderstorms are forecast late Saturday from east Texas, the nexus of the Schmexis, into the Tennessee River Valley. Heavy rain is expected for the east coast and high winds for coastal Long Island into New England late Sunday. And that will be your fun day, especially if you're surfing uh, there in Boston. Let's take a look at the snowfall forecast because clearly no one will be surfing in Boston. Here's the snow moving through Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon into Saturday evening. And you can see by Sunday morning, heavy snow moving into the Pacific Northwest. A small spattering of snow coming down the uh, Rocky Mountain front all the way to Texas by Sunday. And here's your Sunday through Monday, heavy snow moving east, more snow in the west by Monday morning. Monday afternoon, snow will be falling on the Appalachians all the way south to Georgia. This has been in the models for a while, and a second event coming uh, just a few days later will bring heavy snow to snowshoe. Now, by Tuesday night, heavy snow up here in Maine. It's insane, up to 16 inches in the higher elevations or the northern areas. of uh, The areas on the backside of that nor'easter as it moves off the coast. A second clipper is going to come in here Friday, December 16th, 17th, and 18th and bring that heavy potential record-breaking snow to West Virginia, central mountains of PA, the Catskills of southern New York, and more snow for New England for Christmas. And that's the forecast looking to Christmas Eve. Shut up, Al! Get in your hole! He's complaining about the white Christmas. But we love Al Gore, now don't we? He invented the internet after all. And that brings us across the pond to UK's cold and snowy November with rare avalanche warnings issued for Scotland. Can you believe them apples? The Met is one of the worst uh, perpetrators of the global warming fraud, but the data shows otherwise. UK's cold and snowy November with rare avalanches issued in Scotland. November 2023, the United Kingdom had an average temperature of 6.3 C, according to the Met Office, which is 0.1C below the multi-decadal norm. I thought we were all burning up. Well, apparently not in Scotland. This is the moment when brave volunteers from Cairngorm Mountain are, well, rescuing people in a snowstorm. So clearly, the global warming goodness is covering. Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team have released some footage of the moment when their brave search and rescue team endured storm force con Indeed, they did. And avalanche warnings. The Scottish Avalanche Information Service, which barely does anything anymore, issued a considerable avalanche hazard warning, meaning large and very large natural avalanches may occur. Now, this only happens when there is snow, by the way. And we, they said a decade ago there would be no, no more snow. But in fact, the northern hemisphere snow totals have been above the multi-decadal average for the entire season. And they have been for the last three years, but this is not reported anywhere on the mainstream media. Who knew? Now you do. And that brings us over to the snowfall forecast over here in the UK, hey, hey, where major snow has already fallen in Scotland and it will begin to hit the ground again 
It looks like here by December 11th and the 12th and the 13th, and it will continue with heavy snow in the Alps. And look at eastern Russia. Wow. They're going to be buried as well as the northern UK by Christmas. So there is your white Christmas forecast for Europe. Now, local residents are officially on Cyclone Jasper watch as the bomb confirms Douglas Shire, among others, in the potential impact zone. A very rare early season cyclone is barreling its way towards Townsville. Looks like it's going to hit north of there. Well, and the good news is it's not going to hit with much force. Bad news is it's going to bring a lot of rain. So the big threat is flooding. So we're going to move this through here. Here is Sunday into Monday. It's going to do a loop-de-loop -loop here, the tropical storm, and reduce power. And then it's going to strengthen as it barrels towards the coast here by Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday, December 13th for landfall on this part of Australia as 977 millibars to 984. That's going to be Cat 1 or tropical storm strength. Nothing significant. Some winds could be... A little bit of damage, but the big damage here is going to be on the heavy precipitation that persists here for 24, 48 hours, bringing well, torrential rain and flooding. Let's look at the total accumulated precipitation. There it is, 350 to 500 millimeters, and look at it move to the east. More flooding potential for the entire northern continent there. Take a look at Australia's northern tip. It is literally going to be underwater for Christmas, a very wet Christmas for North Australia. 7.1 magnitude hit the South Pacific in Vanuatu yesterday. There was an initial tsunami threat, but no tsunami advisory was issued, and the threat is now gone. Looks like we lost our USGS map, but it's back up. We have some activity south of Iceland on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, pretty significant. That may be connected to the dike that's actually on the island and there could be more magmatic activity this could be a second pulse of activity moving onto the island as we are sitting in a waiting game aftershocks continue out here in the philippines by the dozens and that is to be expected none of those shocks above five magnitude that should reduce and eventually disappear overall moderate uptick in seismicity worldwide above 2.5 but nothing significant to report. There is a slight uptick in the Caribbean we'll keep a close eye on, and a slight uptick in seismicity in Hawaii as well could be signaling Kilauea's next phase of eruption. Now, if you're ever wondering what the biggest recorded earthquake in recent history is, it is going to be the May 22nd, 1960, Southern Chile earthquake and tsunami. We're going to leave you the full three-page PDF below so you can get up to speed on what happened. Uh, here is a brief summary. On May 22nd, 1960, the largest earthquake ever recorded with modern instruments at magnitude 9.5. Wow! The largest earthquake ever instrumentally recorded occurred off the coast of southern Chile. This earthquake generated a tsunami that was destructive not only along the coast of Chile, but also across the entire Pacific in Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. The earthquake was preceded by four important foreshocks at depth, probably blot echo, including an M8.2 on May 21st that caused severe damage in the Concepcion area and generated a small tsunami. Many aftershocks followed with five magnitude seven or greater through November 1st, and then it was boom time. The rupture zone was estimated to be 100 kilometers from Libu to Puerto Aysan, the number of fatalities in Chile associated with both the earthquake and tsunami has been estimated between 490 and 5,700. So not a huge death toll, but it was felt around the entire Pacific Rim. And this is not unique. This is just uh, 63 years ago, and it will happen again. In your lifetime, Probably not in Chile, but maybe up here in Cascadia. So heed the warnings, read the PDF, and get up to speed on the largest earthquake ever instrumentally recorded on Earth. Now, we do have eruptive echoes at Anak Krakatau's menacing power as it resurfaces. This is following the tsunami that took out a lot of people a few years ago. And now that the former Krakatoa is rumbling again, 
quite frequently, people are freaking out. In fact, Krakatoa has seen multiple paroxysms over the last several weeks, and they continue during the past two nights. And there is some video footage from the mainland, certainly not from Anak Krakatoa, but you can see why the people on the mainland might be concerned. Worldwide Volcano News Update. We're going to start with Reykjanes. Uh, according to the latest geodetic modeling results, they indicate the magma influx of the dike has ceased. However, there is still a likelihood of a potential eruption in the area, but it has significantly decreased. Unfortunately, the accumulation of magma between, uh, beneath Svartsenge region is the largest in hundreds of years. And that's bad news for future eruptions. If this dike continues to accumulate magma, we could be talking about a big one in the near future. So we're holding on to hopes that that doesn't happen. Seismicity is quite low after a small flurry of activity over the last 36 hours. The most activity happening uh, far away, and we did have a five magnitude at Bartabunga just yesterday. Uh, looking at the overall tremor here, we have an increase over the last week of seismic tremor. So there, the threat has not gone away. The seismic tremor is still increased, and we're going to keep, keep a close eye on it for you as things develop. The rest of the volcanoes worldwide include San Gay, 20,000 feet today. We've got Santa Huito to 13,000 feet. Mayon has been reduced. The alert status lowered from three to two, which is good news there, as a lava lake continues to bubble on the surface of that cinder cone. We've got Sabankaya to 24,000, Sakotajima to 6,000 today, Merapi, apparently there was an eruption observed by ground people, Fuego to 15,000, Nivado de Ruiz to 21,000 today, Santa Huito to 14,000, Semeru to 19,000, and there is just normal activity worldwide, Dukono puffing to 10,000, Sakotajima, 6,000 foot puff today, and that pretty much sums up the activity. Space weather news. Uh, we kicked off the show with the massive M5.6, 5.4, produced by AR3511 as it's departing. And what, what this is showing us that even at solar max, the Earth-facing quiet is real. Uh, we haven't seen really any Earth-directed explosions from sunspots but we have seen some filament eruptions directly at Earth. The most recent sunspot eruption at Earth was the uh, one that just happened. And so very infrequently do we see Earth-facing sunspots producing coronal mass ejections. It's only when they reach the limb that they become active again. And then on the backside, they have a party and they shoot off X-20s. Which is good news for us here on Earth because an X-20 Earth-facing would be a grid-down scenario. And that is the last thing we need or maybe thinking about the state of the world, the most important thing we need. What say you? The three-day geomagnetic forecast is all calm. This impulsive M5.4 will not amount to anything. And there it is. Look at that. Beautiful. Thank God it's not going to affect us. The, uh, the sun has been quite active over the last two days, and we'll just play this. You can see lots of coronal mass ejections blasting off the sun, none of which are headed our way, which is good news. And they haven't updated the M5.4, so I really couldn't get that. The data sets obviously stopped short. Watch this go through the 8th, all the way up to 2200 UTC, and the M5.4 happened right after that. Eh. Oh, maybe we've got the data. Let's go back there and see. Nope. 18, 20. Because we're going to be looking at it emanating down here. That will be where the explosion is. 2236. And then it's over, Johnny. Yep. They're keeping their eyes on that so you can be safe because they love you so much. Now, there was a big boomer off the backside of the sun yesterday, and we kept Iswa's model up to show you what happens on the backside. See, here we are, Earth over here. But when these sunspots get around the back where the Earth-facing quiet doesn't exist, they go boom, and they smash Mars. Mars got fried on that one. Probably an X-flare, and probably frying Mars. Now, if you do not know about the treasure of Spyro Mounds, we're going to link you below to an amazing blog article in 5, 405 Magazine. Uh, some of the artifacts that came out of these mounds are 
indicative of Mayan culture. And they also meld together the Native American culture, the mound builders, and some of the geoglyphs we found in Idaho. So we're going to be doing an expose on this. I'm going to be right. I have been writing an abstract on a paper for the Idaho geoglyphs, but we need to do more research out there. We need more funding. We have to go out there and do some scientific studies with measurements on the ground. And that won't be till the fall of 2024, if we can even do that. But we're, we're trying to create a bigger picture on who the mound culture was and what was important to them and some of their influences in the Americas. All links will be below. Now, a half a million worth of floating gold was found in a dead whale. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, it's an amazing product. And in fact, what they found in this dead whale was a stone about 50, 60 centimeters in diameter, weighing 9.5 kilograms. And it's, the stone was ambergris, also referred to as floating gold. And this little 9.5 kilogram stone of ambergris found inside of that whale was worth a half a million dollars. Yes, the solid lump that Ferdinand grasped in his palm possessed an estimated value of approximately a half a million dollars, euros. It was actually ambergris known as floating gold, the ultimate desire of perfumers according to the Guardian. Now, ambergris is some type of a colon rock. You see, sperm whales consume substantial quantities of squid and cuttlefish, most of which cannot be fully digested and are subsequently expelled. However, portions linger and gradually combine with the whale's intestinal tract, eventually solidifying into ambergris. Now, ambergris is occasionally expelled from the whale's body, which is why it frequently is discovered floating in the ocean. However, in certain instances, like the one with the whale in La Palma we just showed you, the ambergris grows to such a size that it causes the whale's intestine to rupture, leading to the death of the whale. And this, the trade in ambergris has been going on for years um, and is used in the perfume industry. Now, as part of their efforts to prohibit the hunting of whales, the United States, Australia, and India have implemented a ban on the trade of ambergris, which is creating the soaring price of the product. So interesting stuff. And all the links will be below. Now, a leading Arctic scientist says the climate crisis is nothing more than a globalist scam with global cooling on the horizon. And he's not the only one. There's Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and many others that have been yelling at the top of their lungs for the last decade. And if you're interested in global cooling, I think this article is for you. Now, humanity's oldest art is now flaking away. Can we save it? And what you're looking at here is a 40,000-year cave painting in Indonesia. And it's not the only one. Here in the limestone hills of the Matos, Parenkep, Kars landscape, there are hundreds of caves with ancient art dating between 20 and 40,000 years old, like this picture here, covered in lichen. Yeah, there is an ancient painting of an Anoa or dwarf buffalo, which is now extinct since the Younger Dryas event. So this is literally the most important artwork on earth, and there's no money to preserve it. In fact, more than half of it is undiscovered, according to archaeologists in Indonesia. So if you want to take a trip to discover something, go there and look in the caves. Now, archaeologists have discovered ancient paintings in Indonesia, some more than 45,000 years old, in caves and rock shelters. And here you can see some of those regions. It's all inland, and it's all very high up, uh, which makes sense because sea level has been much higher, so these are the protected regions. Lower regions would have been obliterated, especially with the dating of these. Now, according to Lieb, a staggering 65% of sites contain cave images, some of which are more than 45,000 years old, making them some of the oldest pictures in the entire world. But none of this is being preserved, and more work needs to be done to preserve these ancient works of art. Take a look at these caves. Absolutely fascinating. And so, will we rise to the occasion or, or will we mine it all to oblivion? What say you?
Take a look at this. 3,000-year-old stone mask. Stunning discoveries at China's Shangxingdui ruins. If you didn't know about it, now you do. After sleeping for 3,000 years, their awakening has shocked the world. Hundreds of cultural relics dating back 3,000 years have been newly excavated from Shangjingdu ruins in southwest China's Sichuan province, including this stone mask, which is as trippy as it's mind-blowing. One person dies and five are put on ventilators after catching a deadly disease from their tap water in California. There were, in fact, 14 confirmed cases of Legionnaire's disease, putting three plus three suspected. So that's, if you could do the math, 17. One person died from the disease, which can cause life-threatening pneumonia, and more are at threat. And take a look at the region. Here's the mapped area near Napa where the contamination is expected to happen. Now, CDC investigators trace the cluster of cases to filthy maintenance of several water plant cooling towers. Thanks, California! One of the most progressive states in the world with the largest homeless population and apparently the most disgusting and toxic, toxic tap water. How do you like them apples, Newsom? Now, these filthy Main, filthy, unmaintained water plant cooling towers allowed bacteria to fester and run through pipes into people's houses and their taps. It's so bad that even being exposed to the mist from your tap water could have killed you. And so that's what's happening in California. Time to get out of Dodge. Well, or California, whatever you want to call it. And did they discover a pyramid underwater thousands of feet of water in the Azores? Well, here is Peta, Sierra Island, and just to the south, just to the east of Juan de Castro Seamount, there appears to be a pyramid up on a mountain deep under the ocean. Now, if there was a seismic shift in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to cause all of this to drop down, this is the lost continent of Atlantis. And in fact, this may be the semicircle of the circular feature that once was the lost continent. And for more spectacular links below, I'm going to link you the 457 page from Charles Hapgood's Earth's Shifting Crust. This is over 50 years old and is one of the most censored and, well, quite expensive books to get your hands on, but I'm going to give you the whole baby for free. Link below, Earth's Shifting Crust by Charles Hapgood in PDF. Go get it. And tomorrow, Lee and I will take another excursion on Cosmic Catastrophes on Revolution Radio in Studio B. Right here, click play, noon Mountain Time at Revolution Radio to listen to Cosmic Catastrophe, our show. And we're going to be talking about grand solar minimums and their effects on earthquakes and volcanoes. So we should be expecting magnitude 8 earthquakes and VEI-7 eruptions coming soon. And that will certainly be a boom. But before we get there, I want to end on a beautiful note. Do you know who this woman is? This is a neurodivergent blind pianist. Her name is Lucy Lillington, or Lillingworth. And she went blind at a very young age. Not only that, the tumors behind her eyes caused her to be a less than optimal human. It caused a lot of trauma. And these are some of the people that are brushed aside in society. People think they have no worth. But when I saw this video, and when some other people first saw her play, I'm sure their minds were changed forever. And the people at the mall that heard this for the first time. Now, what... Lucy is about to play as one of the most difficult piano pieces possible by any human, even the best pianist. And Lucy may just well be the best pianist on earth at this time. She is about to perform Nocturne in B flat minor by Chopin. And it is mind blowing. Take a look. How could you? In a minute, you're going to play Nocturne in B flat minor by Chopin. Just start playing. See? Here we go.
It's unbelievable that she can play this piece. How, 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 how does she study? I mean, how, this is incredible. Say anything like this. My spine every time I play it and I hope you enjoyed it as well please share this video with like-minded people I'm all choked up <coughs> become a patreon support the work we do we love you be safe and that's boom thank you Lucy <laughs>